Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I love that song. When I was a student at Abilene, I met the guy, um, got to know him a little bit. The guy who wrote that song um, matches his personality. I think about him when I, when I hear that. And um, beautiful, day to, beautiful day to be singing. I want to welcome everyone today. Um, hopefully you've been blessed uh, thus far in our uh, service. And I uh, want to welcome those of you that are joining us online. We're certainly glad to have you uh, along with us as well. Um, now, for those of you that uh, may not know, we had a little switch. Uh, we, we got some new pews in, in our congregation. Yes, the very ones you're sitting on. You are initiating the pew you're sitting on. Okay, but don't carve your name on it. Please don't, you know, go wild. And in case you're wondering, someone said, did someone put repellent right up front here? Because since nobody seems to take these seats here. But I assure you that they, they were told that the smartest... And the smartest people sit up front there and that the most comfortable pews are there. So in case that is for any reconfiguration uh, in the future, you may want to keep these pews in mind. And here comes Brett right down. He wants to sit right there. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, listen, I wanted to say it's so great to be back in fellowship uh, with you all today. Um, last Sunday, uh, meeting with the Impact Church was just such a great blessing to take part in the congregational meal afterwards was, uh, was really great. And uh, just to see all that, that the Lord is doing, there were over 100 kids that had come in from mostly Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, had come in for their spring break to serve in a spring break vacation Bible school as well as to do some service projects around impact. And it was really uh, a blessing to uh, get to meet them, see all of them, uh, and just to see the, the things that the Lord is doing, I was talking with uh, one of my friends there, is, used to be a co-minister with me, uh, he works in the Spanish congregation, and um, already this year they've seen 25 men and women baptized into Christ, uh, the, the gospel is just spreading, uh, much of this is by contacting people through the outreach of feeding the poor and helping the homeless, uh, it's just been very, very exciting to see the things that are going on. And to be able to send our love from the Brenham congregation and uh, to, to be a part uh, was, uh, was really just uh, really a great blessing. Now, I'll be going back now. Instead of going once a month, as I have been, I'll be going back once a quarter. So it'll be June before I'm back there to preach. So uh, I'm looking forward to finally getting moved here, which we're in that process, uh, and to be able to uh, just... Uh, see more of you. And, you know, someone today said the pews, I've only heard one negative comment on the pews uh, today. Uh, uh, someone said, yeah, it's so much lighter in here. Um, Tim, we're going to be able to see you better. Um, someone said that one, the negative comment, but I haven't been able to reconfigure it otherwise. But anyway, so uh, hopefully uh, that won't disturb you too much. Now, um, today we're going to be talking about leading up to Easter. I want to talk about a topic that is a very, it's the most significant topic that we really could take up from Scripture. And it's one that I think will be a challenge. I think wherever you're at in your walk with the Lord, it'll be a challenge for you. Uh, and hopefully will make you uh, draw close to the Lord and to the Scriptures. And uh, I want to do that by using uh, the uh, story of Nicodemus. Now, before we get there, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the Gospel of John. Just a couple things to keep in mind as we, as we look at the Gospel of John. You know, there are four accounts of the life of Jesus, and, and we know them as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's important because people make ignorant statements about the Bible disagreeing, or why doesn't this guy say the same thing as this guy, and and people just make some of the, the most unintelligent statements. One, because they've never really read the Bible. And number two, they don't understand that faith in the Word of God. I mean, if, we, if, if every writer was going to say exactly the same thing, then God could have just printed one book. Why have four Gospels? And so the early Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them synoptic Gospels because there is a lot of repetition of different parables and interactions in the life of Jesus. And, you know, instead of seeing these as, as one account and every, in linear time, everything has to agree, we've got to see these guys, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, actually, 
as guys who are writing booklets. These are like pamphlets that are going to be used to share the good news about Jesus. And they're all writing to different audiences. And so when you're telling a story in your own life, you can recount a story... And depending on who you're telling it to, you will only use certain details of that story because that's what's important in the time and the person with whom you communicate. We do this all the time. And yet somehow when it comes to the Bible and we see that Mark mentions this fellow and he doesn't mention this guy over here in Luke, we think, oh, this is a contradiction. That is such low, unintelligent reasoning. And I think it's time that as God's people... We don't just lay back and just let people insult the Bible and say things about it that are patently false. We need to realize we don't have anything to be ashamed of because Mark says this and Luke says this. These are men, they are moved by the Holy Spirit, but they are speaking to their uh, prospective audiences. Now, when we get to John, John is written later of the Gospels. These first three, uh, they're written... Oh, probably between 50 and 70 A.D., Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, depending on your specific uh, timeline diagnosis. But the Gospel of John's not written until 90, maybe in the late 90s. John has already been on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled, persecuted, exiled for his faith. He's not only been on the Isle, you remember what happened when he was on the Isle of Patmos, don't you? The book of Revelation happened. That's when, that's when Jesus revealed himself to John when he was in exile. And that's why we have the book of Revelation. However, he was brought back from exile. And, and, and we know he wound up living in the city of Ephesus. And while he was in Ephesus, he was serving there likely as an elder. And what history tells us, not within scripture, is that the elders, the shepherds of the Ephesian church said to John, John, before you die, will you please write down your memories of our Lord? And so it seems that this was what prompted the writing of John's gospel. John takes a very different approach in his writing. He does not take uh, the exact same type of approach. As a matter of fact, John, he, he chooses to write his whole gospel around seven signs and statements that Jesus made. He also writes it around 27 interviews and dialogues. One of the things that I like about John is that he recounts dialogues that occur between Jesus and other people. Some prominent, some not so prominent, some religious, some non-religious. But we see the actual dialogue as it happens. And I think this is one of the beautiful things about this gospel. And, and, And one of these interviews, of course, the most famous of them would be Nicodemus. And I wanted to talk about Nicodemus today, about finding a faith of my own. Because more than anything else, the faith that you and I have is what brings us into contact with Christ and brings us our salvation. Your faith brings it to you, my faith brings it to me. Nicodemus was a man who found faith of his own. He did not have it in Jesus to start with. And we're going to read about that. And today we're going to take one segment of this, perhaps the most well-known of of much of Scripture, actually, from John chapter 3. We're going to take a look at this today. And so I'd like to read starting in uh, chapter 1 and then talk a little bit about Nicodemus. So it says here, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Came to Jesus at night. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Or you may have footnoted, born from above. This word can be translated equally both ways. Neither of them is incorrect. So you may have in your translation that you have to be born from above. That is perfectly allowable in the translation of this language. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. 
So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we ask your blessing over this time of study of Scripture today. Lord, we're just all trying to make it. We are so grateful that we have your word. Thank you that John wrote down these, these dialogues and that we can better understand you and your will for our lives. And as we strive to have faith of our own, we pray that we can learn the pertinent lessons that we find here in this dialogue that Jesus has with Nicodemus and as we will see him later in this gospel. Bless our time together now. Speak to us, Lord, beyond the words that are heard. Speak into our hearts by the power of your Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Here we find this is a very, uh, this is a very uh, popular text. Now, one of the couple things to consider about Nicodemus. One of the things that we learn about him, uh, he says here, to start off, it says, There was a Pharisee, a, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And so he, and he comes to Jesus at night. A couple things to keep in mind about Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus, uh, it, it, in our culture, we don't have quite a correspondence uh, of, of how we might relate to this, but of the Jewish nation, their supreme court was called the Sanhedrin or the ruling council. They decided on all matters concerning the Israelites were brought before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Pharisees were, were people, these were men who devoted themselves fully to the study of Scripture day and night. You know, it says that, that, Jesus came, uh, that, that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. You know, we might assume, and we could be correct, that he's coming because he doesn't want to be seen with Jesus. He doesn't want the word to get out. However, Pharisees were known to be up before sunrise and study the Bible nonstop until after sunset. So it could be that Nicodemus was merely coming from his day-long study in the Word of God to find Jesus. So we don't really know why, but, but, but he's, he meets him at night, and you'll notice he's not acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. Those words aren't used here. The word prophet's not really used here. He just says, we know that you are from God, you couldn't be do it. You'd have to be from God to do what you're doing. So we see that there is a faith that he comes with that is seeking. It's developing, if you will. But, but Nicodemus finds himself in a very elite category. And one of the things about, in, in all of the Jewish nation, there were 71 men that comprised this Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. There was the high priest and there were 70 others. So of all of the spiritual people in the nation, you, you, you theoretically, you've got the 71 most spiritual men in the room. So these are, this, he is in an elite class of people. This is what I'm trying to see how elite Nicodemus was. And not only that, when he, when he speaks to Jesus, he says here, uh, Jesus later on will say to him, you are... You are a teacher of Israel. You're, you're the teacher of Israel. It could be that Nicodemus was in sort of the top 15 of this group who were considered the most renowned biblical scholars of their day. And, and if, in fact, Jesus is saying to him, you are Israel's teacher, meaning you are the one, Nicodemus, he could have been the top scholar of his day in the study of the Talmud and of the Torah and of what we know as the Old Testament. In other words, he lived in, a, in rare air. He was a man among men. He was a guy with stature. And yet, he's coming to try to find genuine faith. 
because his religiosity he knew didn't give him all the answers, even all that he knew. It, it, he knew that Jesus had something he wanted to find out more about. And you know, I think one of the things that we see about this, about this idea that, that here, that Jesus, you've got to love this, right? Jesus has no credential at all. His, none. He's the son of a carpenter. He's gone to synagogue like he should have as a boy. He studied his Bible. But he has no credential like Nicodemus, and yet Nicodemus knows that in spite of all of his credential, there is a man who has an answer. And so he goes to seek out counsel from Jesus. And one of the things that we have happening here is there are a couple of dynamics that, that are going on here. But one of the things that he says here is, he says to Nicodemus, he says, You're, you are Israel's teacher. And he says, um, Nicodemus asks in verse 9, how can this be? He's confused on this born from above or born again thing that's going on. He's not quite understanding it. And, and Jesus says, you're, you're Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things? So here's a question. What does this water and spirit thing refer to? Because Nicodemus isn't getting it, right? And I know sometimes we jump to conclusions. We have our own cultural biases and our own education that we bring to the page. Sometimes we jump to this and say, well, uh, born of water means, because he goes on to say flesh gives birth to flesh, maybe the water is being born, uh, you know, in the physical world, and then being born of the spirit is being born in the spiritual world. Okay? There are many people who, who think that way. The problem is, in the Greek, when he talks about you've got to be born of the water and the spirit, it's very clear that they are one and the same thing. They're not two separate actions. They are one and the same. And so, sometimes then we say, well, he must be referring to Christian baptism. Well, maybe, but how would Nicodemus know about Christian baptism? I mean, he, Jesus is saying, hey, you're the guy. You know the word, and you don't get this? So, I mean, is Jesus trying to just throw something out here and make it up and then hold Nicodemus accountable to something he's just sort of bringing out for the very first time? I don't think so. I think Jesus expected Nicodemus to know his Bible better than he knew it. Or at least he could call to mind what he was talking about. And, you know, when you go through, of course, I know some of you Old Testament scholars, you already know where this is going. But if you've never considered this, I want you to think about this today, that the reference that is being made here to water and spirit is, in fact, uh, let's see, not that one. Right here, Ezekiel chapter 36. What should Nicodemus have been thinking of water and spirit? Well, Ezekiel chapter 36 talks about the new covenant and God's going to provide a new heart and give a new spirit. And so right here in verse 25, the Lord speaks through Ezekiel and he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I think this is what, what Jesus expected out of Nicodemus. He expected Nicodemus to, to know one of the most, Ezekiel 36, one of the most important chapters dealing with Old and New Covenant, the old heart, the heart of stone, the heart of flesh, the spirit. He talks about these things. And so there's a reference, but the problem is that Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Nicodemus thinks in terms of large nation of Israel rather than his own personal relationship with God. Under the new covenant, it was not going to be God relating to a nation of people. It's going to be God relating to the individual person. And so what we find here is that in fact, he says, I expect you, Nicodemus, I, I expected you to know this. I, you're, you're teaching Israel? 
You don't know that part of the new covenant is there's going to be new birth. You're going to be born from above. You will be born again. You will be sprinkled with clean water. This, of course, is, this is a, a, a symbolic thing, the heart of stone. And the, but the, he says here, I will put my spirit in you, and you will be careful and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So someone may say, well, could this foreshadow Christian baptism? Certainly it could. That's not off the table of what can be foreshadowed in this passage. But what is, what's being talked about here is, he's saying, Nicodemus, you have got to understand that your religion got you nowhere. Your education, your money. And by the way, these were some of the wealthiest men in the nation. Interesting, you know, how today some of the most elite religious people are the wealthiest in our nation. But we won't go there today. Okay. But you know what? These guys, they're all... He, and, and so it's, it's almost like here comes Nicodemus, the, the man who's got all the credentials and all the education and all the money. He's got all the influence. I mean, you talk about influencer. And Jesus, with one, with, with a couple of sentences, just sweeps all of that self-righteousness out from under him and says, Nicodemus, that has gotten you nowhere. You will never get to heaven on that, my friend. Your education your money, your popularity, your influence. There is nothing that you can do except you have to be born from above in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. But you know, one of the things about this that I think is that may be most applicable to us is how does, how does Nicodemus find a faith? Now, he's still developing and he's going he's gonna to lead Jesus, and we're not sure where he's going yet with his own faith. And we know, because we've read the gospel, we've read the booklet of John, we know that Nicodemus will, in fact, we'll see him in two transitions, and we'll, we'll get to those, not today. But we know that he will come out on the side of a rock-solid faith in Jesus. But from here until the next time we see him, we don't know all that transpires. But here's the thing. How can we get a faith of our own? This is the first thing I want to bring before us today. You have to be willing to ask the hard question about your salvation. Not the question about what do you think you need to do to be saved. Not the question about what's been taught you all of your life. Not the question about what, you know, uh, what educational degree you may have or, or not have or whatever. But you have to ask the question about your own salvation, meaning that when you transition out of this life, when you die in whatever form or fashion, are you ready? Do you know you are saved? That is how you find your own faith, because it's the most important question a human being can ever ask. When you talk to people that are in the hospital, that are, 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 are close to dying, they're not talking about where they're going on vacation next year. They want to know, am I ready to go? Why? Because they're up, they're up against the portal. They're, they're about to transition and they want to know, am I ready to go? I sat with Madeline. Many of you know Madeline Skinner. She's one of our, our members here, beautiful woman. She's in, in hospital now. And um, I sat with her, and we were visiting. And you got to know Madeline. She's just, she's just a bright, shining light, and she's just full of love. And you never, you never you don't ever have to wonder what's on Madeline's mind. But she, she will let you know. And she'll even tell you what's supposed to be on your mind. You know, she's really good at that. And, uh, you know, it's funny because when I left Madeline, I went out to my car and I made three notes about things in the church that we can do to improve. That's, that's the kind of person she is. But, you know, one of the things that she said to me while we were there was when she said, you know, she's laying in the bed and I'm sitting, I'm sitting bedside there and we're talking. And she goes, you know, Tim, she talked about the uh, do not resuscitate order. And she said, you know, I'm ready to go. She said, I, I, I have had such a blessed life. I, I've just been so... Uh, I mean, I don't want to spend my life going from one hospital bed to the next, going from here to there. Just let me go. I'm ready. Well, I thought to myself, what an inspiration. 
to be at that place and not knowing about what may come. And, and Madeline has a procedure this week, and we're all praying that's going to go great, and she's going to have many more years here in the congregation. But I know one thing, if she goes, I mean, that is the most important thing to her. That's the most important thing to her. I'm thankful for men and women that we have that we can see and know who set great examples for us. You know, I think, I think um, last week there was a young man baptized after, um, after the message in, at, at Impact. And, and uh, I didn't really know anything about him. I knew he, was, he had special needs in the sense he needed several people to get him into the baptistry. And, and as I talked to my friend Carlos about him, he said, Tim, this guy, he loves the Lord. He wanted to be right with the Lord. He's in a, he's in a, a, a mobile wheelchair. And he, he brought his wheelchair and he caught two different buses and took his wheelchair from the bus stop here just so that he could be baptized into Christ. I thought, wow. Sometimes we're so put off by the slightest obstacle, even to come to church. We just come up with all kinds of stuff. But when it comes to the most important issue, you know, last week after my message, it was really interesting. While they were preparing for the baptism, I had a couple of guys came up to me and... Uh, and I was just standing there waiting, waiting for the baptismal thing to get ready. And a couple of guys came up, and they happened to both be a lot taller than I was. And um, they were some of the teens that were visiting. And they came up, and they were like, okay, all right, look, Tim, here's, here, I, got, I got this question in my Bible. Here, what's this here? And, and they're talking about, okay, what, do I, what does it mean to be a true Christian? Do I really need to repent of my sins? Is that part of it? Do I really need, is baptism part of the Christian walk? It is, what, what is it, what does it take? And it, it was so encouraging to me to see these two young teens on their spring break, they had come down, but when they saw what Nicodemus was dealing with and finding his own faith, they were not afraid to ask the same questions. And some of us, we're on a don't ask, don't tell. And definitely don't ask, and I'm not going to say anything. But the issue is, we are going to have to answer that question. And to find our own faith, it's got to start bottom line. Am I ready? Do I know that I'm saved? Now, I want to say this, because uh, we're going to finish up here just looking in... Um, we're not going to go to numbers, but I want to, want to look at this passage. Let's see here. Let me back up one here. In, Right here. So in John 3, before we go any further, we see here, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I want to tell you something. You can do all your religious stuff you want. I'm, I'm it. I'm the one who will be lifted up for you. Not your religious duties that you plug in and you feel like you do so that you can sort of soothe your own self-righteous ego. He swept all that away. And he says, just like, in, in, in the, just like Moses was in the wilderness. Now, we know here what he's referring to, right? And if you don't, I'm going to give you a short synopsis of what's going on because I think this is very significant. The, the story of the wilderness snake, right? We, he's talking about Numbers chapter 21. I would encourage you this week in your own personal study, go back and read Numbers chapter 21 because it will tell you the entire story, the short drama that unfolds about this snake that's put up on a pole in the wilderness. Now, you know the book of Numbers, don't you, right? We could, we, you could call that the book of gripes, G-R-I-P-E-S, gripes. Basically, from start to finish in the book of Numbers is the, is the, are the Israelites complaining about one thing or the next. First, they don't like this. They don't like Moses. And they don't like, they don't like who Miriam's married to. And then they don't like, and then they don't, and they... Sounds like some churches I know. Gripe, gripe. Gripe. Never get happy. Not this church, by the way. I'm not talking about this one. But if the shoe fits, please apply. <laughs> but the book of Numbers is just God's people. The Lord has delivered them. And yet they just complain, complain, complain. 
And so finally, the Lord has had enough. And it says that as, as the Lord had them wandering in the wilderness, it says, that, it says that the people started to just get angry with the Lord and said, Moses, tell the Lord we're sick of this. And we're sick of this food, by the way. Tired of this manna. What is this stuff anyway? In how many ways can you prepare manna? Right? You got banana bread. Uh, you got manicotti. You know, you got a few things you can do with it, right? But there's not a lot you can do with it. And after you've been out there for years eating the same thing, we're sick of it, Moses. And you, you, you just bring that to the Lord. You let him know we are fed up. And says the Lord's anger burned against his people and he released among them poisonous snakes. And so while they're defiantly saying, I've had enough, I'm sick of this, they start dropping like flies. They'd been in the wilderness, by the way. They know how, they know how to deal with snake bites, but their, their, their human remedies weren't working. And so they say, Moses, we've had a change of heart. We want you to go back and have a dialogue for us, okay? But you know what? We got a new cookbook. We love, we love manna. We got different ways to do this. We're fine now, really. This is all good. You go back and tell them we're, we're all fine. Just, just please, just, you'll get rid of these snakes. And you know, God could have just taken all those snakes away. But you know what he told Moses to do? He said, you take a bronze snake and you put it on a pole. Everyone who gets bit, everyone who looks at that snake will survive and be healed. That's the remedy. You say, who, who came up with that solution? Really? I mean, isn't that a little drastic? I mean, snakes everywhere, and we're going to put a snake on a pole, and, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. That is one of the points that's being brought out. God, the, the issue is not does it make sense to you and me. The issue is do you believe and do I believe that God will do what he says he will do. Full stop. And when I get bit by the snake, I can try my remedy, I can say my prayers, or I can believe that God will do what he says he's going to do. I'll look at that snake and I'll be healed. You know, today when it comes to salvation, it's not a complicated issue. Sometimes, you know, say, well, it doesn't make sense to me that why did God have to become a human? And why did we have a savior of the world that has to die on the cross like a common criminal? I just don't get it. You don't have to get it. What you have is snake bites and you're going to die from them. And unless you gaze upon that one who was lifted up as savior of all mankind, you and I don't stand a chance. It doesn't matter how much we run around, how much we pretend this and do this and say that and act like I'm not as bad as this person over here. It means nothing unless you have embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior, given your life to him. You say, well, does that mean I need to repent? Absolutely. You say, do I need to be baptized? Yes. Do I need to live as a faithful Christian? Or now can I just say a, say a prayer and get a baptism and just go my merry way? Sometimes we expect God Almighty to accept things we wouldn't accept ourselves. We, 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 you know, in our professions, we have clubs and we have, we have uh, you know, different things we belong to. And, and you can't just pay a token and join. You actually got to show up and do something, Right? You got to be involved. Somehow, when we think when it comes to God, all you got to do is just, oh, yeah, I want to be saved, and uh, off I go. Don't have to do anything. Just, where are we learning this? We're not learning it, and we're not drawing to Jesus as the lifted up Savior of the world. Because when we are, we're not asking, what's the least I can do and get by? If you went to the, if you went to the, Whole altar of holy matrimony and said, honey, I love you, but I, what's the least I can do to get by? Uh, it's over right there, right? Hey, call off the wedding. That's not how relationships work. 
When we love the Lord, we're not asking what's the least I can do to get by. It's I, I give him everything because he's my solution to everything. It's Jesus. It's not my good works and feel good about me. And He is the one that paid the price. Today, when you think about your own faith, have you asked this tough question? Ask it for yourself, not, not do you think you know what you should, ought to do. I mean, are you, full stop, are you dealing with this and, and know and confident of your salvation? We don't have to live in fear or wonder about our salvation, but we have to answer the question, am I ready? Do I have my own faith? We're going to stand and sing a song together. And, and today, we didn't have our prayer cards out. If you have a special prayer requests and maybe you didn't get to, to fill in, if you want to respond to this message in any way, asking for prayers, we want to invite you to do that as we stand together and as we sing.